Yeah, it is. Wobbly. It's okay, I'm a little wobbly. I was in band for seven years, you guys. <laughs> I can fix a stand. <laughs> Whoever can guess our instrument gets a free. Uh, you guys will never, you'll you'll never, never guess it. Oh, the French horn. Oh, no. I didn't say what you guessed. French horn? Yeah. I still <laughs> play my horn. Gorgeous. Baby. Uh, That's amazing. It's the only great. expensive thing I own. <laughs> so I got to keep playing it. <laughs> All right, so that. All right, welcome guys to Ice Cream Social. This is almost our two year, so it's really exciting that we can do this for this long. And you keep coming and sharing your work with us and agreeing to be featured readers and agreeing to eat ice cream. I know it's so hard, <laughs> but we're really happy that y'all could make it out tonight. And it feels like summer finally, so it feels right to eat ice cream. More than usual. It's the only consolation. So, um, we like to start out our ice cream socials with an open mic, and we've got six people signed up today, which is a great, well rounded open mic for us. And uh, we're going to your name, Maris Finn. Hello. Um, it's good to be back. So, I'm going to read just a couple of pages from my novel In Progress. Um, I read the first part of it last time, so if you're if any of you were there. Um, this is just a couple chapters later. Uh, all you have to know is that um, there's five girls in the desert, and they've escaped from their sinister desert town, and they were just picked up by drifters in the middle of the desert after about a year. Um, this scene takes place on the back of a pickup truck. Arthur's garbage dump in neon blue. I could have sworn I saw it with my own two eyes, but it could have been a dream. It became hard to draw the lines between real real, book real, and just plain fake. In the beginning of our desert stay, the five of us would share our dreams. Sometimes they'd be wistful, wish-fulfillment dreams that brought us back home. 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 One of those words that when you say it over and over again, it starts to lose its meaning. But relaying these dreams had the opposite effect. It became more painful than describing our nightmares. Every time one of us said the word home, it was like dropping acid in our eyeballs. Leora once went on for hours about seeing herself sprout giant antenna, big hairy feelers is what she called them, and being unable to control what she ate. The antenna, she said, made her hungry for puppies and birds and bunny rabbits and she couldn't do anything but eat them. Angie dreamt about her teeth falling out one by one, and when she bent down to pick them up, blood poured out of the holes where her teeth were, and her head shriveled up, and her brain slid out of her nose. Vera's nightmare stories usually included water. She was able to breathe underwater, and she described deep sea creatures in such detail that it was scary. The names anglerfish and isopod and lantern shark fell out of her mouth so easily I wondered if she'd made them up. Had the words spelled themselves out behind her eyes? She described their bioluminescence, their weight and size and pointy teeth like elephant tusks with such detail that I wanted to search her bag and see if she brought along a marine biology book and kept it hidden from us. Hannah's nightmares were run of the mill. Her legs didn't work, her voice didn't work. The schoolhouse had turned into a labyrinth. She'd try to amp them up with some gory details about how such and such was chasing her, but it didn't compare to the other girls' gruesome ones. What's more is that Angie and Leora and Vera described their dreams so easily like they were just simply recounting the events. Theirs were no exaggeration, but Hannah's were all exaggeration. My dreams and nightmares were one and the same but I'd switch up how I'd talk about them to make the other girls happy, to follow suit. Me, naked, a boy, naked, a camera. The boy had been from school. In the dreams, we would, we would be wading knee deep in water and we'd walk around and talk. Not that exciting. Sometimes our knees would knock under the surface. It was hard to dream walk in the dream water, slippery, and we'd both almost fell lots of times, but we'd each be there to catch each other. One dream, I slipped and fell, and he didn't catch me. And as my head fell beneath the surface, I felt my nose and eyes burn. 
Another dream, I slipped and fell, and the person who hoisted me up out of the water was Hannah. And then she draped me over her shoulder and carried me to shore, helping me out of my wet clothes and heaping dirt over my body. When I woke up from those dreams, all I wanted to do was dig into the dirt with my fingers and tunnel my way back home, close myself in a room, a door, all I wanted was a door. What'd you dream about? Hannah would ask each morning, unfolding out of her beautiful slumber. How dare she ask? She had no idea what was going on in my head, and even if I described it in the most perfect detail, she wouldn't understand or she'd tease me. So I lied, and I made up stories about flying bicycles and shrinking my body down to ant size and living in the earth. Just as I knew Hannah was exaggerating, I'm pretty sure she could tell I was up to my eyeballs in fancy. We only allowed ourselves to really talk about boys when the younger girls went to sleep. We'd sneak away from the girls, letting them sleep like little puppies, and then we'd talk about boys, everything. We'd take turns drawing what we thought penises looked like in the dirt, each one longer than the last, until Hannah drew one that was so big it was the size of me. I wouldn't even know how to go about drawing a vagina, I said. Well, spread your legs and we'll find out, she said. She laughed, and so I laughed, but then she stopped laughing. I think I'm tired, I said. Yeah, me too, she said. Let's go to sleep. And we had, quickly, pressing our thin bodies against each other like the last two bananas in a bunch. I did see Arthur's garbage dump, though, at least the sign for it, and it wasn't any goddamn dream. Thank you. starting to revise stuff for my thesis manuscript, so hopefully they're a little better than the last time you heard them. <clears throat> Hawks don't circle. The cold spring water knifing my skin was punishment for not calling off the trip, though I knew I was going to leave him. Clouds blocked the warmth and light. I kept my sunglasses on so he wouldn't see the truth making crow's feet in the corners of my eyes. Every time I glanced, in his direction, the sob nestled in my chest, threatened to break loose. After my fourth beer that morning, I dredged up some tipsy faith. I'd loved two men at the same time before. I could do it again. By the grace of the Devil's River, I'd find a way to make things work. We watched a hawk float on the thermals. I'd always thought they'd circled. I'd always assumed I'd never have to choose that my heart could have everyone it desired. Two weeks prior, my new lover had corrected me on the subject of hawks. I opened my mouth to tell the old love what I'd learned. Before I could get a word out, he turned his head and said, I know. This one is called Picture of You Straddling Two Countries. The Rio Grande is only shin deep, but the current almost pulls me over as I try to take the picture. You stand, grin, ask, which side am I on? Beyond the frame, you'll step onto the Mexican riverbank, stare at the sheer cliff of the Santa Elena Canyon, say, any politician who thinks he can build a wall has never seen a border. Yesterday, on the Boquillas Canyon Trail, we saw carved walking sticks, painted rocks, a handwritten price list in Spanish, a collection bowl, an artist slipping across boundaries undeterred, a creator so desperate for livelihood she would risk the border patrol helicopters buzzing along the desert sky. I wish I'd bought something, wish I'd let her know which side I was on. I'll do one more. Uh, the epigraph for this, so this is called Still Life with My Love in the Act of Surrender. The epigraph is St. Edward's Park, parentheses, hungover. A month of rain revived the waterfall, current looking frothy enough to drink. His eyes close to the sky, to me, he sleeps on stone, 
Mosquitoes keep their distance, make me their only meal. Sun turns his flesh brown, mine goes red as the western sky grows brighter. Sweat pools in the crooks of my elbows, along his hairline, the air taking all we can offer, sparing us nothing. Dragon flies frantic in their breeding, wildflowers blanch in the light. Whenever I watch him sleep, I hear a clock counting down the days we have left. I swear I see the waterfall already receding, recollecting heat. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Up next, we've got another regular ice creamer, uh, Taylor Benavides. One by one, you planted seeds of yourself in me. Through time, there are flowers of your memories that soak through the inside of my concrete wall that surrounded my heart. But when you hurt me, it felt like a drought, where I needed sunlight and water, but all you kept giving me was more of your angry words. That pain made me wilt away, and suddenly the garden in me was full of dead promises and broken feelings. I wanted to feel alive again, so I ripped out every part that belonged to you and gave myself to any stranger with brown eyes. And I was radiant. I was free. But you changed. You changed and you were loving, and once again you tried to plant yourself in me, but it was too late. Your roots were too dead for your flowers to grow in my heart anymore. Social, you may remember our next open micer. She's back to regale us with some more poetry. Thank you. So this is a rough draft uh, of a poem that came out of my frustrations with online dating. <laughs> <laughs> it's a diatribe of sorts called The Future of Sex is Now. <laughs> Someday has reached such sexual release that climax is coitus today, and foreplay is past command X of sex unsaved, unrecollected. Someday, today, XX and XY have no need to leave a will. Breaking some unwieldy seal, man and woman surpass sexes and become the speed of light. Succeeding ceaseless, beyond the bondage of body land, bordered and mapped, past unwrapped tenses, senses will themselves to be self-willed, no longer tethered in all direction to stitched, stretched leather, and whether or not to be or not to be distills to Descartes. And as for becoming, i.e. sex, is a set of binary letters simultaneously coming in infinite combinations. The body becomes its own symbol. Our eyes are asterisks or asteroids, windows punctuated by stars of fire. Our mouth is smile or frown, one of two options, parentheses, up or down. Our expressions send sentiment sideways, contact light received between screens. Our voices are pre-recorded. Together, we are one voice of a man once named Black Hole. But thankfully, we don't know what the word name, or black, or whole, or word means anymore. Today, we see speechless. Today, we speak insignia. Today, we seek emblem. Love is not language, but signal sent as a single action measured by one social network with status updates kept in quantitative proportions. Love is not a continuous feeling, because luckily, feeling has been discontinued. All but the <laughs> ultimate emoticon. An empty outline of the symbol once known as the heart now toppled over on the side of forgotten. Long forgotten that it's actually the silhouette of a prostitute's ass, cropped, <laughs> perched, and primed for man mounting. Relationships are established and reinforced by the number of click likes, the number of swipe rights, the number of complete views. Not you are all, but the number of URL visits, tabulated by the accumulation of zeros and ones. 
until numbers some threshold potential where x cannot equal two makes three or nuclear four. A square where each family unit is a side, making the area aware that numbers have become unreal and unsolved by radical equations of classifieds advertising one request, one request cloned ad infinitum, colon, one plus one mainframe seeks another one for computational symbiosis and artificial copulation. A lick on the bit is a click on the link. A suck on the stuck key is a grip on the last external drive, inserting the C into the V, or the C into the A, or the F into the V. It's replaced with technology so cutting edge, one must be careful not to delete as keys press, click, Type, hard, pound, enter, exit, <laughs> enter, shift, control, shift, all caps, data, entry, sent, again, and again, and, 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 coming is a cell dial tone, is a call dial tone, outmoded, unknown, without voice activation, mute incantation, no one picks up. No one answers on the end, other end of bodies. No one calls for the other end of flesh. Success. We are left with progress. In excess, so tight, live wired, frayed and tired, as shocked cold boxes, stacked, unsold, dead stock mines, stored with cursors circling, no sign of life but the trace of man's face and an eye cloud iris around red light blinking our unstoppable end. The culmination culled from what was once under skin is now kept in glass screens, some cracked, some pristine. And every heart is a cursor, cycles, waiting, turning, waiting. Now I'm blushing for the rest of my life. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have one last featured reader um, who's graced the open mic before, Sam Trevino. Hey, y'all. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's see. This poem is, um, I guess, inspired by the, the, um, the bus that um, runs daily from Boston to NYC and back and forth. Like, Basically, it goes from Chinatown to, 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 to Chinatown, and it's it's like, well, on the East Coast anyway, it's like pretty famous for being cheap and sketchy, and on occasion just like blowing up on the highway. <laughs> it's called, let's see, and um, the the other inspiration came to me one day at in airport. The Airbus. The Airbus is the fung wall of the sky. It tumbles through clouds, breaks down, and catches fire on the horizon, and arduous sunset. The angels inside are entitled to speed field trips to Chinatown just like the rest of us. In the back, some dude in a drug rug offers them cocaine. I mean way in the back. So far from everything, you might as well call it purgatory. Here, the, the lost souls share a single seat, start making out and pissing off the abuelas who glare in their church hats. Good lord, you think, have a sleep. In the same clothes for the third day running, are we there yet? Somewhere on board, a baby cries, and homesick ghosts keep you awake. All right, uh, I wrote a poem, uh, it's called, let's see. It's not the heat, it's the humanity. <laughs> Stepping outside is like galloping into a sauna. An army of cicadas and trees and tall grass sing their white noise harmonies as they slip out of their exoskeletons, all slow and sensual, and leave them, leave them to dry in the Texas sun like undergarments on a radiator. We could wring moonshine sweat from our shirts and stay drunk on the sheet for three days. A scorpion, hardly bigger than a quarter, shakes its pinchers at the world. It doesn't know its own poison or how to control it. It will burn and kill any old thing without meaning to, out of a dumb animal fear. It's the dog days of summer. It's not the heat, it's the humanity.
best open mic yeah. session <laughs> anywhere. Um, so we're really grateful for everyone that shared. Um, and I think we're going to take a quick five-minute break. Um,